Milwaukee Area Technical College. In this age of multimedia entertainment, there is quite an assortment of visual stimuli to occupy one's time. Television, theater, video entertainment of all sorts, as well as motion pictures. But in the not too distant past, our peers and the peers before them lived in a world of limited, yes, limited escapism from the rigors of everyday life. During the mid to late 20s through the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, before television really affected the multitudes of people who, until then, only had the household radio to keep them entertained, often tuned, tuned to a grand and respected place of beauty and escapism. This place was the local neighborhood theater. Here, a community could withdraw from the world around them and delve into the world of the motion picture. Classic movies like Casablanca, It's a Wonderful Life, and Gone with the Wind were shown in even more classy surroundings. I'm your host, Craig Shannon, and tonight on Motion Picture Places, we will, through the power of video, journey to three of the Milwaukee's older scenic movie theaters, the Oriental, Avalon, and the Paradise. We'll meet the current managers of these theaters and learn the history and aesthetic qualities of these palaces, as well as the current condition and future aspirations the managers of these theaters hold for them, some of the finest motion picture palaces Milwaukee has to offer. With that aside, let us waste no further time. Off we go to the far eastern influences of the Oriental Theater on Milwaukee's east side. The Oriental opened July 2nd, 1927. Uh, after almost more than a year's uh, worth of construction, and it was built at an estimated cost of $1.5 million. Um, this was significantly over budget from the original $800,000 that uh, it was projected to cost. The opening day's attraction was uh, naughty but nice with uh, Colleen Moore. Uh, there was a stage show and also the house band uh, played. And there was uh, also a pipe organ in the theater at the time. Uh, the Oriental was built in a period that uh, where movie palaces were at their zenith. Uh, they were actually called dream palaces. These were palatial surroundings for people to come in off the street and uh, leave their pro worries and troubles outside the door and be treated like royalty. And uh, they were the ultimate fantasy palaces. And at one time, there were literally thousands of theaters like this built across the country. But uh, very few of them remain. And even fewer are still operating as movie theaters. Uh, one interesting fact about the Oriental is it has been open throughout its entire 63-year history. It's uh, never been closed. So that's, uh, it's been a lasting uh, monument that has been able to be enjoyed on a daily basis by literally, uh, you know, millions of people over the years. The theater was built by uh, the Saks amusement chain, and the architects were Dick and Bauer, who had done quite a few of the theaters for, for this amusement chain. They did uh, the Tower Theater, which is now part of a uh, family hospital uh, over at 27th and, 27th and State, um, or excuse me, 27th and Wells. Uh, the motif for the Oriental is kind of a, it's hard to describe, it's, it's Middle Eastern, there's a lot of different influences. Uh, it's not tr Oriental in the sense of Chinese, but more Oriental in the sense of the Orient, the Far East. Uh, and that's where a lot of the decor comes from, the use of elephants, the, uh, the paintings of, uh, of Mecca. Uh, a lot of the, the, what looks like just filigree is actually uh, Sanskrit writing. So there's a lot of different ele elements that are combined uh, into this type of architecture. The thing that always impressed me about the Oriental is that compared to other theaters that were built during this period of time, um, it's a much more playful kind of atmosphere where a lot of other theaters were more palatial and uh, looked like museums. The Oriental is more of, I always describe it as having more of a carnival effect. We come in 
and you've got the lions on the stairway, elephants everywhere you turn your eye. Um, so it, it was, a, to me, it was a much more playful type of architecture. Um, during this time, this explosion where movie theaters were being built, um, the whole idea was with each new theater that was built to top the previous theater. So it was an architect's dream. They could just uh, let their imaginations run wild. Uh, and the budgets uh, obviously were no cost, were no problem either. So it was like each new theater that was built had to have some new element that would make it the newest, the best, the, the most innovative in some way over the previous movie palaces. And uh, the Oriental was heralded at the time it was opened as being the, the finest example of a Middle, Middle Eastern uh, architecture in the United States. At one point, there were theaters similar to this in almost every neighborhood in the city. And unfortunately, over the years, as neighborhoods declined, as uh, attendance in movies declined, uh, a lot of these theaters fell by the wayside because they were huge uh, parcels of real estate and buildings that had to be maintained and heated and cooled. I think what has allowed the Oriental to survive is really the stability of the east side neighborhood. The fact that uh, it's near the lake, uh, there's a broad mixture of uh, types of people here. Uh, there's expensive homes, there's apartment dwellers, uh, there's senior citizens, there's college students, there's young professionals. But overall, the stability of the east side real estate market and uh, business district has been very strong. and. Um, I think that more than anything has, has helped the Oriental survive. Uh, even though, I must say, in the early 70s, things looked pretty bleak for the theater. And I think the res resurgence in the theater, uh, particularly the, the renovation that was done three years ago to turn the theater into a triplex, uh, really has to go, the compliments have to go to the company that operates at Landmark Theater Corporation because. Ever since they took over the Oriental in 1976, that has really been rejuvenated, uh, and it's had more and more people coming through its doors than uh, it probably had had in many, many years. The Oriental uh, Theater, since it, the conversion to Triplex, has just uh, been on a tremendous roll. It seems that more and more people are discovering the theater, and um, people are coming from all parts of the metropolitan region to come to a movie here, even though it may be playing at a theater closer to their home, and a, a, an evening at the Oriental is like an evening out at the Performing Arts Center or the Riverside where it's an event. Um, it, it's, it's truly a night going out to come in to such op opulent surroundings and uh, see a movie in, in the surroundings where movies really were originally intended to be seen um, in a dream palace. And I think as far as for the future goes that uh, the Oriental should continue to do very well. I think that uh, the stability of the east side and its location between uh, both the major universities in Milwaukee is going to ensure that uh, it's going to have a, a, a bright future well into the next century. The Oriental Theater is located at 2230 North Farwell Avenue. We'll now move on to Bayview and take another scenic movie palace, Bayview's Avalon Theater. Unlike the Oriental, which is primarily a first-run theater, the Avalon operates today as a second-run theater. It is equally as beautiful as the Oriental and has prospered through the years through a dedicated following and upkeep of its picturesque and serene atmosphere, as the owner, Eric Levin, will explain. Uh, the Avalon is really unique because it's Milwaukee's last atmospheric. There were five total in the 20s and 30s, but the others gradually went under or became liquor stores or warehouses. But the Avalon has, has survived that um, due to a, a very strong following, primarily within the neighborhood, very strong neighborhood theater, which you don't see very often. Um, the atmospheric theater is one that uh, creates a courtyard effect in the auditorium. Um, almost always it's under a night sky with sparkling, uh, twinkling stars 
and uh, it's a Mediterranean or Italian motif. The Avalon was designed by Russell Barr Williamson, who is a disciple of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, was a very prominent Milwaukee architect, uh, designed a lot of residences in Shorewood especially. And I guess the theater presented a new challenge for him, um, the opportunity to design you know, a fantasy place of entertainment must have been something totally different from what he was doing. I don't think that you could say that uh, this is done in the prairie school style. I think it's totally a different idiom. It's the idiom of the atmospheric theater. It's kind of a typical example of an atmospheric theater. The Avalon is done uh, in, to simulate a Mediterranean courtyard. The auditorium gives the effect of sitting within this courtyard, an open courtyard with a night, uh, night sky above and stars twinkling in the sky. Originally, there were clouds projected on the ceiling that would slowly crawl across from left to right. And there were also originally vines and a number of uh, plaster statues that lined the gangways. Those have since uh, been taken out. But the auditorium gives, still gives the same effect that it did when the theater opened of sitting in this open courtyard. It's kind of a typical example of an atmospheric, some were Spanish, some were Italian type motif. Um, but all had this common uh, open air effect that's so, you know, enchanting. I mean, that, that was the excitement of the atmospheric. Yeah, in order to enhance the lobby, we've added a lot of uh, movie-related items that people get a kick out of seeing. Um, we have a couple of cases that uh, contain actual movie props uh, from horror and sci-fi films. That generates a lot of interest. We also have a number of uh, movie posters and uh, movie memorabilia in the lobby just to add you know, additional interest while people are out waiting in the lobby, waiting for the film to start. The pipe organ that you're seeing and listening to was typical of the instruments that were used in motion picture theaters back in the uh, late 20s, early 30s. They were established primarily to provide background for silent movies. They wanted to have some action shots, they would have sound effects to take care of whatever action might be on the screen. And they were also used uh, for sing-alongs and just general musical entertainment in the theater maybe after the show or after the particular motion picture. Along came the sound films and uh, these instruments became in disuse. So we feel rather fortunate to have maintained a number of them in theaters throughout the country. Fortunate to have two or three here in Milwaukee and particularly proud of the one here at the Avalon. Uh, this organ has been maintained by a group of hobbyists who are in love with theater organ music and they're known as theater organ enthusiasts, and uh, they are preserving these instruments and providing entertainment for people that uh, remember them as they were in the old days, and trying to bring uh, this particular form of entertainment back to the younger generation. Um, the main effect of the organ is a unit orchestra type of sound. It got its uh, name that way because of the various sounds that it can duplicate. And there are various ranks of pipes in the organ that simulate the sound of a trumpet or a horn or a violin and uh, a flute. And these sounds, similar to an orchestra, when combined together, give a very unusual sound and tone that uh, people begin to latch onto and thoroughly enjoy. Um, as a number of uh, organs throughout the country, 
they are beginning to be uh, restored and we're fortunate that uh, they're being maintained by other enthusiasts throughout the country. Here at the Avalon, the organ is being used for uh, just entertainment, obviously. We're back to sound movies. We don't use them for accompanying films anymore, but they are used to, uh, maybe at the beginning of the show, to uh, let the people hear that grand sound. And then periodically there are public concerts held, maybe two, three times a year, where people can come in and enjoy a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour performance of just organ music performed by artists that are still trained and providing that kind of music for everybody's enjoyment. Uh, my goal had always been to own a theater, and uh, the Avalon was the perfect opportunity, really, for us. And uh, there's just a lot of potential here. I mean, we can do things that that the chains just couldn't dream of doing. We can do. We're doing celebrity appearances in conjunction with films. We're doing um, concerts, all kinds of. Uh, things other than just uh, film, uh, which are really keeping the place vital. It's really an opportunity to do some very uh, fun things here. In that segment, we learned something about the old pipe organs that were used years ago as the musical background for silent films, and later on as intermission and pre-movie entertainment. The Avalon is located at 2473 South Kinnickinnick Avenue in Bayview. This brings us to our last movie palace, the Paradise Theater, located at 6229 West Greenfield Avenue in West Dallas. The Paradise, like the Avalon, is primarily a second-run theater. It, however, is one of a kind in the fact that it shows a weekly classic motion picture from the era of entertainment that the theater represents. As the manager of the Paradise, Ben Weinstein will explain, the Paradise is going through some minor restoration so as to bring the beauty and the quality of the theater's past back to the present and into the future. The Paradise Theater opened in 1929. Construction began in 1926. I believe the opening day was in late November 1929. It was a theater of the Fox Theater chain, which, interestingly enough, was the only theater chain that didn't go into insolvency during the Great Depression, which happened about, I guess, two years later. The theater was designed by a man named Urban Peacock. We've never been able to determine whether that was his real name or that was his uh, nom de plume. Um, both my partner and I, since we took over the theater, we've really wanted to find Urban Peacock and beat him up. Because for a theater that was designed with 1,400 feet seats, which apparently hasn't been dramatically changed since its original design, it's incredibly poorly laid out for 1,400 people to circulate to the concession stand, to the bathrooms, even in and out of the theater. But that aside, there are some marvelous things about the theater. Um, it has, I think, the, the tallest ceiling of any theater in, in Milwaukee County. People get very impressed by that. The first thing they do, they walk in and they go like that. Just, just like that for a little while. No one's complained about neck pains yet, but um, I'm sure it's coming. But also, some of the, the nicest ornamental plaster is on the columns which traverse the proscenium. The proscenium arch is, of course, the vital part of any movie palace. And the palaces were designed around their proscenium arches because the proscenium arch was the gateway into the cinematic world. Like most movie palaces that were built in the 1920s, the Paradise was not originally built with a concession stand. The theaters were built without concessions. The movies were just the attraction. The concession stand in the Paradise was added in 1951. They knocked out a couple of rows of seats in the back and put in the concession stand. That was, I think, the first major architectural change that took place. Now, of course, there used to be balconettes in the front of the theater, and there used to be draperies that hang in the archways along the sides, and there were also some more fine, detailed plaster work. However, the 1950s, which saw the advent of Art Deco, okay, and the Art Deco movement 
was represented in theater architecture by the, the uh, I believe it's called Streamline Moderne. And that's exactly what they did in a place like the Paradise. They came in and they streamlined it. They took out the balconettes. They took down the drapes. They, they removed a lot of the plaster work. Aside from that, however, the theater is not substantially changed. The Cream City Theater Tour Corporation, that is to say, us, took over the theater about 14 months ago. Now, if you look at some of the arches, you'll see that there's some, there's some significant damage, actually. And if you know the layout of the theater, and I've seen blueprints and I've also been up there, there's a water, there's a roof drain over each one of those damaged areas. So it was essentially really just a, a matter of about a month of a broken roof drain I managed to put them in that condition. The previous management never took any interest in replacing them. Since we took over the theater, we have A, stabilized the damage, B, done the grossest kind of work on it. We're still waiting for an opportunity to do the finish work, which is all that remains to be done. We've also, of course, worked extensively on certain structural plaster damage that was not in the detail work, but was in, for example, there were some holes in the roof of the lobby. There were uh, some holes in the side of the auditorium, which we've, of course, well, was the first thing we did, was patch those up. We're very enthusiastic about what we're doing right now. We are bringing the highest quality of modern entertainment and the highest quality of cinematic entertainment that has been made in the past to the theater. And we are doing it in such a way that anyone who wants to come and see these films can bring their entire family. It's 99 cents to come and see the budget films on the weekend and it's $1.50 to come and see the classics. Even though a lot of people are not aware of it, The Paradise is the least expensive repertory theater in North America. We're going to continue to work on the theater. We haven't stopped working on it since we took it over, whenever we have an opportunity. That was our original motivation to be closed on Mondays. To be open, we needed a day. We could have a 36-hour period from Sunday night, or a 48-hour period from Sunday night till around Tuesday afternoon to work without being interrupted, without having to clean everything up. That was the original motivation. That enabled us to change the layout of the concession stand, to work extensively on the seats, to work extensively on the bathrooms as well, which have been our main project so far. Like most movie palaces, after its initial opening, say, after the 1950s, the paradise went into a decline because there was a movement away from the single-screen neighborhood theaters like the Majesca, the Uptown, the Avalon, the Oriental, toward the multiplex suburban theaters. Most of the theaters, the single-screen theaters in Milwaukee, for example, the Majesco, which closed in February of 1990, the Uptown, which closed 15 years ago, the Garfield, which closed in the 1950s, even. They just died. The Paradise and the Avalon managed to survive all the way through. We don't know how. The, the Paradise reached the nadir, the lowest point, I would say, during the late 1970s. It passed through four or five different owners between 1970 and about 1985. And the whole period, the history of what was happening at the theater during that time is shrouded in mystery. We have not been able to ascertain definitively what kind of films were shown here. Someone has told us that at some point there was a fire in the theater. We've not been able to ascertain whether that occurred or not. We've been told a number of different things about the paradise during that period, none of which we know are true or not. All we know is that since we took it over, we have been rapidly building a very faithful audience for both our budget films and the classics, and the audience continues to grow. This past week, we showed Gone with the Wind, and we had an attendance of 1,200 people on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night. As far as the future is concerned, we will continue to do exactly what we are doing. We will continue to promote exactly the way we are promoting, because we feel that we are nowhere near the maximum number of people who are interested in seeing these films. It's simply a matter of finding them and in getting the word out. And once they know, we, we know that they'll come to the theater. Back then, theaters are, are, are what they were supposed to be. As you probably noticed, I am too young to experience most of the grand theaters as we've just shown you and many of them are still closing and struggling to survive.
the Majeska just closed last year in February. But for me, I'll take the old theaters any day. The big screen gives that great effect that movies were meant to be seen in. The newer theaters are meant to cram everybody as close as possible to get people in, and they don't care if you enjoy the show or not. The screens are getting smaller, and the, pe and the whole theater is getting bigger, and that the discomfort at the clients. As you probably noticed, all the theaters there, they, nothing was spared. All the decorations and architecture, as the Oriental cost $1.4 million, I think he said, which is phenomenal compared to nowadays where theaters would probably cost only 800000 and that doesn't include inflation. So, the aspiration of Ben Weinstein, Eric Levin, and Kevin O'Neill is to bring back the classic motif of the theater as an artistic statement. In this, the era of multi-screen movie theaters that look more like airplane terminals, it's refreshing to know that there are people who are willing to restore the old motion picture places to their once grand appearance. So next time you feel like seeing a good movie, see it in a good old theater and appreciate the culture of what used to be. Workshop Series is produced by second-year telecasting students enrolled at the Milwaukee Area Technical College.